we've been talking about the theme height, a kingdom perspective. And if you're here for the first time, we welcome you. Glad that you're here with us. Just let me catch you up with what we learned. In our first message, we called it Welcome the King. And in it, we define what kingdom means, that there's three components to a kingdom. A king, who is Jesus, the subjects and followers, that's us as the believers, and a domain, which means the already but not yet. Meaning, it's a place that's coming, but presently, Jesus is ruling and reigning, hopefully, in your hearts. So how we submit and yield to him gives testimony to a watching world that Jesus is alive. And so hopefully you're doing a good job with that. That was our first message. Our second message was called Cross Talk. In it, we saw the central figure and the symbolism of the cross and how that has significance for us because as we deny ourselves and take up the cross, according to Mark chapter 8, we are basically dying to ourselves. We are asking Jesus to be connected to him and we are now relinquishing our rights and yielding to his lordship. And as we do that, then we can hopefully proclaim what Paul proclaimed in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I know nothing but except the Christ, Christ and Jesus crucified. And what an important message that is, because then the cross releases us from our old self. It transfers us collectively from death to life, from darkness to light, from oldness to newness. And that led us to our third message, which was called A New Creation. We spent time in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, new has come. Because the cross is a symbol of death, now it's released us for new life. And the new life is in and with Christ. And so through that, we get to represent him. And in that passage in 2 Corinthians, we have been given a ministry of reconciliation and we're called to be ambassadors for Christ. And once we do that, then we can get the word out. Because we know the ending, as someone prayed already. Jesus wins. And we want to extend that kingdom so that more and more people will come to saving faith. That was the whole weekend, in a nutshell. And that sets us up for our final message, which I've entitled, Extending the Kingdom. We want to now know three questions that we're going to answer. Why, how, and where? And what I want to do in our time together is speak specifically about not only you collectively as a church, but how you individually in your vocation would be able to extend the kingdom and demonstrate the king no matter where you are, whether you're a DA, whether you're an educator, whether you're an engineer, you're a house mom, whatever it may be, how can you represent Jesus and extend the kingdom? Would you bow with me as we pray and ask the Lord to guide our time together? Father, we thank you that the kingdom is real, that it is amongst us, and that we are yielded to you as the king. We know that the kingdom can go everywhere. Hopefully most clearly shown and demonstrated through the church, but also extending to the schools, the marketplace, and our city. This is what you desire. And this is what you've called us towards. So as we learn now some strategies from your word of how to do this, why to do this, and where to do this, help me to be careful and clear as I share your word with these dear friends. So commit our time to you now, and we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our outline is simple. Why, how, and where. So let's go after the first question. Why do this? Now listen carefully to how I say this because I don't want you to misunderstand this. One of the reasons why we need to extend the kingdom is because salvation in part, not whole, let me clarify again, in part depends on us. Now let me be very clear here. You don't save anyone. Jesus saves. It's a work of God. But he, some, for some reason, invites us to be a part of this plan by leaving us here on earth to be those messengers of the king, to share the good news of the gospel so that people then can respond to God through the message of Jesus. Does that make sense? So again, let me be clear. You don't save anyone, but we get to be a part of the process. What is my support for this? Take a look with me now at Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. 
Here's what Paul writes. He writes a series of questions that are rhetorical in nature that give us a clear answer. Here's what he says. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. This is an amazing passage when we think about it. Because it's not something we have to do. It's something that we get to do. I hope you know the difference. When you have to do something, those are called duties. When you get to do something, that's called devotion. I, I share with some of you, as I was talking with you, some of you asked me, which job do you like better, pastoring or preaching or, you know, professorship? And I said, that's a hard question. That's like asking, which child do you favor? There's not a right answer to that, hopefully not. I like both equally. And the reason why is because I get to do these things. I, I get to study the Word of God. I get to share with students. I, I get to minister to people in the church. I get to serve the Lord. And I even get paid for this. Not very much. But I'm thankful because this is my calling. This is my niche. This is my vocation of what God wants me to do. It's the most freeing an exhilarating thing anyone could do because I know what God wants me to do. And I hope sooner than later, many of you will get to that place where you say, this is what God has called me to do. But with all of that foundationally, you also get to share the message of Jesus, the gospel, with whatever vocation you're called towards. And we'll get to that in our third point. So again, look at verse 14 specifically. How will they hear without someone preaching. That's you, friends. You, in part, get to get the message out because it's a privilege and an honor that God invites you to share in this partnership. This is also reaffirmed stronger in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Let me read this passage to you. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Let me say that again. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A lot of those titles, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, people for his own position, comes from the Old Testament. And what's shocking about that is it was mainly geared towards a Jewish audience. But by the time it comes to 1 Peter, it's now widened to a larger audience that it's not only Jewish people, but Gentiles. Now, just a little New Testament history here. Gentiles not only meant non-Jewish people, but when it was in the plural, it basically meant unbelievers. And so now what's interesting is he's calling people together, lay people, people who were formerly unbelievers, Gentiles, and the Jewish people to come and serve together as the chosen people of God, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation. Why? Because you have the opportunity to proclaim the excellencies of how he has moved you from darkness into his marvelous light. And once he says you were not a people, now you are God's people. What an incredible charge that is. What an incredible honor that is. We get to represent Christ as the people of God. And notice what it says, proclaim the excellencies of him. It's not your message. It's not about yourself. It's your life as a sign pointing clearly and directly to Jesus. How's it going with that? Are you proclaiming his excellencies? Do you feel like you're on a mission for God, that you're chosen and you get to represent? We talked about this last night as an ambassador. An ambassador is an honorific title of empowerment. 
where you go and you help people make peace between a holy God and a sinful people, and you get to share that key message of Jesus in the gospel so that people will respond. This is the why. And this is so important for us to understand and embrace so that this becomes a driving force of our motivation. It's not about guilt. It's not about duty. It's about your devotion to Christ. So this leads us to our next question. How? How do we do this? The first statement that I will give you is this. In the best way possible. How do we do this? In the best way possible. The first Peter says, proclaiming the excellencies of him. Are you excellent at what you do? In your work? In your relationships? In your lifestyle? Would an employer look at you and say, he or she represents God? Because he or she is proclaiming his excellencies. We are charged with this from Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. Look what this passage says. Whatever you do, and that word whatever is a very expansive term that embraces everything. Whatever you do, work heartily. And the word heartily means from the innerwards of your bowels, from everything internally, and all the intestinal fortitude that you could ever muster up. It's saying, grab all that, and whatever you do, work heartily. Look what it says, as for the Lord, rather than for, not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you would receive the inheritance as your reward, and he says it again, you are serving the Lord Christ. I have secondary and tertiary bosses at Biola and my church and so forth, but my number one boss is Jesus. If he gave you a review of how you're doing, how would it go? Now, the good news is he will never fire you. But he may say, hey, what are you doing? Remember who you work for. Remember who you represent. And remember the ramifications that are not just temporal but eternal based on how well you mimic and demonstrate clearly the kingship of Jesus. Whatever you do, work heartily. As for the Lord. Why? Because you are serving the Lord Christ. You know, when I think about people that I work for, secondarily, and my bosses and chairmen and so forth, I want to do my best. Um... I'm kind of a people pleaser in that way. But I wonder if we can transfer that into not just a people pleaser, but a God pleaser. That he would look at us and give you a foreshadowing of what he will say to you at the end when you stand before him after this life, which will be, well done, good and faithful servant. That's where we should be heading for. That's how we offer up all the things we do, our work, our relationships, our situations, everything that we owe, we offer that up as a sacrifice to him. Why? Because scripture calls us to do that. Here's another passage. I referred to it last night as well. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Let me read it to you. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Two observations from this passage. First from verse 1. When Paul writes, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that wigged out the Jewish people. You know why? Because they were a sacrificial system people. And so most of the sacrifices that were offered were dead. They were cut up, they were charred, kind of like Korean barbecue, but pork. And all that was what they would imagery, dead sacrifices. But Paul's flipping that, he says, now present your bodies as a living sacrifice. I wonder if we read this and yet still live in deadness 
Do you know what I mean by that? Living in deadness? That we, we don't do these things as a living sacrifice. But that's exactly what Paul calls us to do. To sacrifice your things, your resources. Here's a big one. Your time for the Lord. And the reason why is we're told in the second part of verse 2 that by testing you may discern what the will of God is. Or other translations say that you may prove what the will of God is. And then it's three things. That which is good, acceptable, and perfect. This may challenge you to think about some of the wording here. We're not called to find the will of God. Did you know that? It's already revealed to us in the Word. We're called to prove the will of God, that it is good, acceptable, and perfect. And the way we do that is by living out God's Word. If you do a sample, there's so many passages that talk about the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, the whole idea that you are called to, to abstain from sexual immorality. This is the will of God. There are so many passages that are very clear like that. And what this passage in Romans is saying is, now that you know it, let's show it. That's the testimony we talked about with the analogy yesterday of music. Your life is the tune that brings people in who will ask them about the lyrics and then you can share about Jesus and the gospel. But if your life is not in sync, no one's going to care. No one's going to ask, and no one's going to inquire. You realize that the Christian life is a qualitatively different kind of living. John talks about this in John 10.10. 10. He says, I came that they might have life, and life abundant. So we think one-dimensionally. We think eternal life is a long time. It's a quantitative thing. Eternal life actually is that, but there's also a depth of a qualitative nature of eternal life. It's the abundant life. It's the purposeful life. It's the focused life because it's Christ-centered, gospel-centered. And when we live out that kind of living, it gives more credence and validity and credibility to the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I want to speak to you for a moment, those of you who are leaders or potential leaders in the future, whether it be elders or deacons or just teachers. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, there's a pretty daunting list. And as you look at this list, it's the list for what's called overseers or elders. This was my area of study in the, my doctoral dissertation. And one of the things that I want to calm calm you down in is this. Those passages are more direction than perfection. And so the reason why they're called elders is because they're older. Which means it takes a long time for you to get to that point. How many of you like kimchi or kakdui? Do you like it ripe? Or do you like it unripe? Some of you say unripe. Okay, I respect that. I, <laughs> I prefer ripe because you get the fullness of that. Some of you are unripe leaders. That's okay. You'll get there because it's about direction more than perfection. But it takes time. When I counsel people, say, oh, this leader's too young. And I'll say, yes. But that problem actually solves itself easily. It just takes time. Give them a little guidance. Let them become, you know, fashionable or mature like a fine wine. It'll take time. There's no instant maturity in Christianity. It's not like cup of noodles. It's not like that. It takes time. It takes seasoning. It takes input. And it takes a lot of prayer. As you have future leaders, I want to just challenge you. It's about direction more than perfection. It's going to take time, but there's a greater opportunity for you also to prove the will of God to a watching world. Too many leaders have fallen and failed, and that has brought reproach upon 
Christ and the church. Don't be one of those people. As you understand this, there are people who are watching you. I was incredibly encouraged by the different outreaches that you're doing. This is an opportunity for you to go outside the realm of the church and again extend the kingdom of God to people who don't have any clue or idea what that is. You represent the king wherever you go. And that leads to our third point, where. So if I can quote a group that I listen to, the answer to where you can go is here, there, and everywhere, according to the Beatles. This is interesting because this means that the kingdom project is not localized, it's universal and globalized. Matthew 24, 14 says, and the gospel will be preached to the whole world and then the end will come. We have been trusted with this great commission, this message of Jesus. And again, if I can refer back to Jeremy Treat's book, Seek First, he has a chapter in there entitled God's Work in Our Vocation. Look, look carefully, because some of you fall into these categories. There's a number of important things that would be really helpful. And again, if you want me to send you the PDFs for this, just let me know. Number one, there's a redemptive work of God's saving and reconciling actions. Pastors do this. Counselors do this. There's God's creative work, God's fashioning of the physical and human world. Musicians do this. Architects do this. Interior designers do this. And then there's God's providential work, God's provision for and sustaining of humans and their creation. Plumbers do this. Firefighters do this. And then here's an important one, which I understand there's three or four of you. There's God's justice work, God's maintenance of justice. Lawyers do this. Law enforcement does this. And then number five, there's the compassionate work, God's involvement in confronting, healing, guiding, and shepherding. Doctors do this. Nurses do this. Psychologists do this. Social workers do this. And then there's God's revelatory work, God's work to enlighten with truth. Educators do this, scientists do this, and journalists do this. Remember what I said last night, that every one of you is a minister? You don't have to go to seminary to be a minister. Seminary will help you, you'll learn more, and if you teach, then that's something that you're called to do. But I want to say to you this, again, you will go to places that I could never go to. So you must go. You must embrace your calling and your vocation and do whatever you do with excellence, whatever you do heartily for the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the Lord whom you serve and he's your boss and your standard is astronomically high because he wants you to represent him well. But he guides you with his spirit who's inside you. He empowers you with his word who's beside you. And he lets you practice with the people around you, i.e. the church. You see, God has equipped us with everything that we need. So it's not a matter of lack of resources. It's not a matter of, well, there's no opportunities. In my estimation, it seems to be a matter of the will. We just... Don't do it. For whatever reason or excuse there is, we just don't do it. Remember we said that kingdom work in part is dependent on you. Let me frame it another way. God's done his part. He sent Jesus, gave us the message, he empowered us with the spirit, he's given us the maintenance book or the instruction book, the Bible, He's given us opportunities, and he lets us stay here on earth. Do you see how he set it up for us really well? Now, you just have to go. You have to extend the kingdom. Not because you have to, but because you get, get to. I was sharing with some of you that I've been very impressed with this church. I like to spend time talking to the people, and many of you are very impressive with what you do and your commitment to this church. Longevity speaks volumes to me. But you can go to the next level, I think. 
And I don't say that to butter you up or as my boys would say, to glaze you. I'm not glazing you. <laughs> I'm saying this because I really mean it. If you could be a, not just a glimmer or spot, not a small light in the valley, but you would be a beaming light that would attract other people to come because you have something different to offer that the world cannot ever match. That is your calling. So here are three application questions for you to think about. Number one, will you do it? I I think there's a right answer. (laughs) Number two, do you have a greater sense of urgency? Like, I got to do this. You know, again, I'm not going to slam you if you did this, but isn't it so funny when Trader Joe's had those bags? Everyone were like, oh, their bags are in there. Let's go. And they lined up and they're jumping at it. That's urgency. But is that that important? People's souls require a greater sense of urgency. Does it not? And the question that I asked last night as well, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for me to put up a starting gun and say, go, bang, while I'm doing it? Bang, go, start, begin, continue, and do so for the glory of God. So here's our central truth as we bring our time to a close. God calls us as kingdom builders to share the good news of Christ wherever we go for the glory of God. One more time. God calls us as kingdom builders to share the good news of Christ wherever we go for the glory of God. Would you bow with me as we close? My hope in our time together has been to raise a greater level of urgency for yourself. Last night, as I asked you to write down the names of people who are in your circle that desperately need Christ, I hope you were able to identify this. Today, what I ask you to do is to put a time frame on it. When will you go? So that's the next question I ask. You know why, you know how, you know where. That's the final question. When will you go? I hope your answer is as soon as I can. And no more excuses. No more lame reasons. Understand what is at stake. People's eternal souls. More than a bag, the nice store, more than a nice sale, people's eternal souls. Faith Harvest, continue to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Continue to love on one another. Continue to work together as a group, as a village, as a family. And always, always be centered on Christ as you proclaim his excellencies, because you have been transferred from the domain of darkness to the wonderful and marvelous inheritance of light. That is no small thing. That's a glamorous and wonderful, grandiose thing. Wouldn't you want to share that with other people so that they would also know King Jesus and be a part of the kingdom? So that the term BFF would really be true for some of your friends in eternity, best friends forever. May that be your calling. May that be your challenge. May that be your heart. Lord, I thank you so much for our time this weekend. Again, much to process, but a few things to do. So help us to be called to this with a sense of urgency, a gospel urgency to share and to care and to love on people with the message that Jesus saves. 
Help that to be clear in our lives, so much so that before we even utter a word, people will see it. They will see it coming because of our love and our devotion to you. So thank you for the time that we've had together. And I continue to pray for Faith Harvest as a church, for Pastor Edmund and his family, for all the leaders here, that they would again represent you well with the Ministry of Reconciliation as honorific, excellent ambassadors for Christ. So help us to now follow that lead and give our honor to you, Jesus, as Christ the head. We thank you, God, and we praise you in Jesus' name.